Hello everyone, this is Miss Nook with By Barbara College. Today we're going to tackle uh, chemistry, the basics of chemistry. In barbering, it is important to know about chemistry, chemicals and things of that nature because we deal with them on a daily basis. Whether we're using a, a chemical to um, disinfect or whether we're using chemistry to do an actual hair color or a permanent wave service. So, however, it is a very important for you to understand the basics of chemistry. This is chapter seven in the platinum or the gray book. All right, so we have a couple of learning objectives. We have about 10 with this chapter. The first learning objective is to define organic and inorganic chemistry, to know the difference between the two, to know that one was once living, one was never alive. One takes hydrogen, the other one carbon, okay? Uh, Learn objective number two is to find the properties of matter. So these are the same things that we learned from grade school. Um, learn objective three is to discuss the physical and chemical properties of matter. Four is to explain oxidation, reduction reaction. Learn objective number five is to describe emulsion, suspensions, and solutions. Learn objective number six is to define pH and also to describe the pH scale in the best of your ability. Number seven, uh, learn objective is to explain how product pH levels affect the hair and skin. Sometimes the pH is too high. It can harden the hair, dry it out. Uh, learn objective number eight, name nine types of shampoos. Let's see, learn objective number nine is list the four the four classifications of conditioners. And the last one is to recognize other cosmetic preparations used in barbering services. Okay, so barbers should study and have a thorough understanding of the basis of chemistry as it applies to barbering. So an understanding of chemistry will enable you to use professional products effectively and safely because we have to understand that a lot of professional products, they have a label on them, but they do not have directions on them. They do not come with directions. So that's up to you to understand the chemistry and the chemistry of hair because hair is nothing but chemistry to allow yourself to be able to service that client by mixing those products appropriately. Let's see, chemicals are common ingredients found in the products used in the barbershop and in our barbering services. And also an understanding of chemical preparations and their effect on the hair and skin will help you to select the best products to achieve the desired outcome because each client that comes into the shop even if they're getting the same service, they're not getting the same service because they will want, each person has a different goal with their hair. Each person envisions their hair differently, okay? From the way it feels, some people care about the texture, some people care about the smell of the hair, some people care about um, the pliability of the hair. So you, you have to know how those things work together. Um, also, an understanding of chemical preparations and the effect of the hair and skin will help you to prevent or solve problems that can occur during product application. All right, so understanding the basics of chemistry. Uh, let's flip on over and let's go with chemistry. So chemistry is a science that deals with the composition, structure, properties of matter and how matter changes under different chemical conditions. So how matter changes? Matter come in three different states, which is solid, liquid, gas. So we're just gonna say that we have an ice cube. That ice cube is in solid form. Okay, it's pretty cold in the freezer, so it stands solid. I have now taken that ice cube out of the freezer 
and I've set it inside of a glass. So now the temperature from being outside the freezer to sitting on the counter in the glass is not the same temperature. So that solid ice cube will now begin to melt. And as it is beginning to melt due to its change in temperature, it has now become liquid. Now, as that liquid continues to settle, it continues to sit out um, on that counter in that glass, what happens is that it begins to evaporate and it becomes a gas, okay? Um, let's see, organic chemistry is the study of substance that contains the element carbon. So organic chemistry contains carbon, all right? Which means that if it contains carbon, it are things that are living or things that were once alive, okay? Now, a couple of um, examples that we have of organic chemistry would be gasoline, synthetic fabrics, plastics, pesticides. These are all considered to be organic um, because they are manufactured from natural gas and oil, which are the remains of plants and animals that died millions of years ago, okay? That's organic chemistry. Remember, once alive, contains carbon. So, going right on in with inorganic chemistry. Inorganic studies substances that do not contain carbon. It does not contain carbon, but it contains hydrogen. No carbon, but hydrogen with inorganic chemistry. Okay, so a couple of things um, will be an example of inorganic chemistry where things that will not burn, so metal, minerals, uh, water won't burn, air won't burn, uh, ammonia, those are all examples of inorganic substances, okay? Um, let's go on over with elements. Elements is the simplest form of chemical matter and contains only one type of an atom, okay? That's over on page 179 in your platinum or gray uh, textbook. Then it talks a little bit about atoms, how they are the basic building blocks of all matter and the smallest particle of an element that has the chemical identity of the chemical, all right? That's atom. It talks a little bit about molecules, so make sure you read over that. In identifying the different states of matter, I've already told you about solid liquid gas. Um, let's talk a little bit about physical properties over on 181. So physical properties, characteristics that can be determined without a chemical reaction that do not involve a chemical change in the substance. So a physical property, physical property includes but are not limited to color, solubility, odor, density, weight, melting point, boiling point, and hardness. Those are all physical properties, physical properties. So chemical properties, characteristics that can only be determined by a chemical reaction that can cause a change in the identity of the substance. So, rusting iron. Uh, once iron begins to rust, we cannot revert it back. Uh, burning wood, once that wood is put inside the fireplace and we let that light the fire, once that wood burns and it turns to ashes, we cannot reform those ashes to being wood. So chemical properties, chemical properties, okay? Uh, now, physical and chemical changes. So a physical change is basically something that can revert back to its original state of matter. So physical change. Um, I have on lipstick, okay? This is a physical change because I can take this lipstick off and go back to my original state of matter, all right? Chemical change would be more so like a tattoo. That's something permanent. I can wash that. I can rinse that. It's going to be permanent. Uh, certain hair colors are permanent. Those would be considered to be uh, chemical changes. So chemical change, it cannot refer, refer back to its original state 
of matter, okay? Chemical change. So the chemical composition or makeup of a substance as in the iron to rust example that we talked about with chemical properties, that will also be a great example example of a chemical change, excuse me. Um, let's go on over to the next page, 182. So oxidation, oxidation and reduction. So oxidation can be defined as either the addition of oxygen or the loss of hydrogen, okay? That's oxidation is either the addition of oxygen, O2, or the loss of hydrogen. So oxidation is a chemical reaction that combines and clean a, an element or compound with oxygen to produce an oxide. An oxide. So a lot of times um, over the last several years, we've seen a lot of washing powders now they're coming out and they're saying, oh, they have oxide in them. So that's basically what it's saying. It's just chemistry, okay? Uh, reduction. Reduction would refer to either the loss of oxygen or the addition of hydrogen. The addition of hydrogen. So oxidation and reduction, they are opposites of one another. They're opposites of one another, a uh, redox reaction, redox, oxidation, and reduction always occur simultaneously. They occur at the same time and are referred to as a redox. So in a redox reaction, the oxidizing agent is always reduced and the reducing agent is always oxidized, okay? Let's flip on over. The textbook then on 183 starts talking about exothermic reaction when certain chemicals uh, reactions release energy in the form of heat. We know exo means heat. Uh, it is called an exothermic reaction. So an example of this is the, it's the heat produced after mixing the activator and the waving lotion in the exothermic permanent wave product. Okay, so it's activated by the heat. So the heat, it could be activated by, it's already close to the scalp and we know our scalp area return, retains the most heat. So if you cover with a plastic bag, that could be equivalent to exothermic uh, with the exothermic permanent wave or if you place it under a heating cap or a, um, a blow dryer, okay? Mm -hmm. Exothermic reaction, so an exothermic reaction, I'm sorry, an endothermic, endothermic reaction. Endothermic reaction is a chemical reaction that requires the absorption of energy or heat from an external source from the reaction to actually occur. All right. Um, then the textbook talks about defined pure substance and mixtures. Um, a lot of people think that water is a pure substance. It is not a pure substance. Um, identifying chemical compounds. The textbook over on 185 talks about defining solutions, suspensions, and emulsions. So the solution is basically the solute uh, plus the solvent will equal the solution. So the solute, we know that water is the universal solvent of the world. So the solute would be the product, the solvent would be the liquid or the water, and then those two combined will equal the solution, okay? Then the textbook talks about suspensions, emulsions, surfactants, surfactants. So that's a substance that allows oil and water to mix or emulsify by reducing surface tension. So the term surfactant is a contraction for surface active agent. Surface active agent, that would be a surfactant. All right, so you wanna look at that. And then um, learn about water and pH. So the pH scale runs from zero to 14. So with seven in the middle, meaning that seven is neutral, anything upward of seven would be considered to be alkaline. 
anything downward uh, from seven would be considered to be acidic okay so just um, make sure that you know the difference between the ph scale when it's talking about zero to 14 okay know that like lemon juice is a two so it will be acidic um vinegar would be a three it's acidic ammonia would be a 12 so that would be alkaline alkaline because it's upward of seven okay um let's and also the letters pH is potential hydrogen. Potential hydrogen is what pH is uh, referencing. Okay, and then on 189 is talking about acids and alkalis. Um, so acids have a pH below seven. It would taste sour, turn litmus paper from blue to red. Um, Let's see, alkalis have a pH above seven. They're gonna taste bitter, feel slippery on the skin and turn litmus paper from red to blue. So once again, we got opposites going on uh, with the acids and the alkalis. Then it's going right over into the uh, shampoo and chemistry. So the acidity or alkalinity of a shampoo is important because it influences how the product will affect various layers of the hair and the skin. So, um, let's flip on over to 191. Uh, the hair shaft and alkaline solutions. So, if it's an alkaline solution has a pH above 7, it will soften and swell and expand the cuticle scales of the hair. So, Another thing is this right here too. Water can also swell the hair up to, um, you know, 20%. So just know that if you're using an alkaline solution, it's going to definitely, the water alone has swollen the hair up to 20%. So the swelling of the hair could be very substantial. Then it talks a little bit about shampoo molecules. Um, identifying types of shampoos. Uh, like we said earlier in our learning objectives, we have five types of shampoos. So you wanna make sure that you are um, reading about that. No, we have nine types of shampoos, excuse me, nine types, okay? So you got a pH balance shampoo, a balancing shampoo, clarifying shampoo, color enhancing shampoo conditioning shampoo, medicated shampoos, neutralizing shampoos, sulfate-free shampoos, and then you have a uh, shampoo for hair and replacement and wigs. So a lot of different shampoos. And then it's gonna identify the different types of conditioners from instant to treatment, repair conditioners, leave-in conditioners, and also medicated conditioners. And there's a difference between treatment conditioners and medicated conditioners. Medicated could mean that maybe I'm having um, issues with my scalp, uh, maybe I'm having dandruff issues, or um, then with treatment or repair conditioners, it could mean that Maybe I've overprocessed my hair, rather it was in a chemical as far as a relaxer or something, or maybe it is as far as I'm in the coloring of my hair, I overprocessed it. So that would be more so a treatment uh, for conditioner, okay? Um, then it's, the textbook is gonna go into the ingredients in the conditioner, the scalp conditioners, and then it wants you to become familiar, the textbook wants you to become familiar with styling aids like hair tonics. Uh, reviewing other cosmetic preparations will be on page 197. Then it's going to go toward the end of the chapter. There's a couple of review questions. Please be sure to look over them. And the terminology, you have about two full pages of terms uh, with chapter seven. Um, so just please make sure that you are reading the chapter thoroughly and doing the review questions in the back. This is Ms. Nuke uh, speaking on chemistry, the basics of chemistry, chapter seven in the Platinum Book from Vibe Barber College. Thank you. Have a great day.